My name is Richard Gordon, and I'm a professor of law uh, at Case Western Reserve Law School. And um, as you might have seen from my uh, biography, I actually started out as a tax person, teaching tax and practicing tax. And um, having done that for some time and, oh, I don't know, I guess getting a little bit bored with doing that, uh, I decided I would change career paths from being an academic and a tax lawyer and uh, joined the International Monetary Fund, where I did all sorts of interesting and somewhat sort of strange things. <clears throat> Primarily, though, uh, actually, the, the day I got to the IMF, which was in 1994 to start working there, was the day of the Mexican peso crisis. And my boss, uh, who is um, Corsican, actually, came into my office my first my first day there, and he said to me in his perfect Corsican accent, uh, Richard, there's a problem with uh, the peso in Mexico. Do you know anything about the bonds, sovereign bonds? I said, I never even took securities regulation. I have no idea what a bond is. He said, oh, but you do tax, so you must know something about money, and bonds pay money, so you're in charge. <laughs> so for the next seven to eight years, I worked on sovereign debt restructuring, through the Latin American crisis, uh, through the Russian crisis, Ukraine, uh, and then all of you may remember the delightful Asian financial crisis where I worked on debt restructuring there. Uh, and now I'm not working at the IMF, just how much fun it would be if I were there now, given what's going on in Europe. But um, although I might not have been working, I think probably I would be working on Greece right now. Um, but what happened to me, <clears throat> It's kind of similar to what happened to me when I first arrived there, was um, an emergency came up. My boss came in to talk to me and said, do you know anything about? And I said, no. And he said, but you know something about money, so you're going to be working on this. And that was uh, actually just before and then most importantly after 9-11 when the IMF and the World Bank and the rest of the international community became so deeply involved in countering the financing of terrorism. Uh, when I started, it was completely tabula rasa for me. I knew nothing about the topic at all, and it was a very steep learning curve. But it was an absolutely fascinating thing uh, to be involved with, uh, of course, given the fact that it was a terrible tragedy. So um, for those of you who are not involved in the regulation of financial institutions, and in particular, um, the area of compliance with money laundering and terrorism financing rules, I will tell you that it is an interesting subject to get into and quite a morass if you're not used to it at the beginning. Um, so what I'd like to do is to, I'm sorry, I've, I've been a professor for long enough that I had this strong desire to walk out there, right? But I'm not allowed to because this is being simulcast, I guess. Um, I did learn as a teacher that um, the more you walk amongst students, the less likely they are to be searching the web and doing emails because you're looking at their screens. But the real reason is it's the more, more likely I will not fall asleep while I'm talking. Um, I'd like to go back in time to when there was no terrorism. There is no such time. OK. I will go back in time uh, to my, I would say, my youth when I first became acquainted with the financing of terrorism. Now, um, I'm from Massachusetts. Incidentally, for those of you who are doing this for CLE credit, in Massachusetts, once you get into the bar, all you need to do is pays your money. You don't have to do CLE. So um, that's just an aside. Um, so I'm from Massachusetts, and I grew up in a, actually in a farm uh, up near New Hampshire. But my sisters were considerably older than I. And uh, they were going to school in Boston at the time. So I would frequently go in and visit them. I would be 10, uh, 10 or 11. And being uh, good children of the 60s, they would take me to bars and things like that. And of course, in, in Boston, Cambridge, um, the drinking age is a recommendation only. So I would be able to go into bars. And there was one very, it's actually, I think it's still there in Cambridge, called the Plow and Stars, after the famous Singe play. And uh, one of my members was walking in, and there was a guy sitting at the bar with a hat out. And people would come in and put money into the hat. And I said to, to my sister, Claudia, I said, what's going on? Uh, is this some kind of panhandler or something? And she said, no, he's collecting for the provos. What are the provos? 
the provisional wing of the Irish Republican Army. My first experience with terrorism financing. Um, I remember the second time I went to the Plow in the Stars, there was a guy sitting there with a hat wearing nothing on at all, but that's another story. <clears throat> okay, so this guy's collecting money uh, at the uh, Plow and Stars. He's getting a bunch of cash. So first of all, what happens to this cash? What do you do with money if you're interested in uh, supporting terrorism? I mean, obviously, there are different uses for the cash. You could use it. Oh, uh, the, the IRA, the provisional wing of the IRA at that time was very fond of an explosive called C5, um, which is made uh, in various places east, in Eastern Europe, but outside of Prague, I believe there was a factory that was making it. And so perhaps this money would be transported to Prague to buy some C5 directly from the factory, or it could be transported to some other place where somebody has procured from the the uh, warehouse, some C5, and then maybe you'd go to Poland or maybe even to, in the UK, anywhere. And then you could purchase the C5 and then transfer that to the IRA operating primarily in Northern Ireland, although not just there, also in the UK, um, which is part of Northern Ireland. Uh, Northern Ireland is part of the UK, so I should say uh, the actual island of Great Britain. Um, and then that could be used by the terrorists. Or, um, other things the terrorists might need, safe houses, places to train, just things like food, um, essentials to keep body and soul together. So those things, probably it's harder to pay for those other than in the area in which the terrorist act is being committed. Also, one of the things I might say that we found in, in doing some research into this is that not surprisingly, terrorists, like everybody else, don't trust anybody else. So they would rather have the actual finance, the cash, the liquid cash themselves, to decide perhaps on the spot uh, sometime in future what they want to spend it on. And also they're just afraid to have other people with control over this kind of material that they use to engage in terrorism. So they would actually like to have the money themselves. Now, I suppose the question is, um, number one, is how do you get whatever the the items, perhaps like C5 or bullets, um, even conceivably, I suppose, food. But um, how do you get these to the terrorist? How do you get the money to the places where these things are purchased? And then how do you get the money to the terrorist themselves so that they actually have the cash and can decide what to do with it? Um, well, you don't have to be a terrorist to figure out some of the ways you could do this. And I, I know, I'm guessing, I didn't speak to the fellow who was collecting money for the provisional wing of the IRA in his hat, but he was probably getting piles of cash. Um, the easiest thing to do with the piles of cash probably would just be to bundle it up and give it to uh, your cousin Sean, who happens to be flying over to Belfast anyway, in a suitcase, or maybe it's not that much money, um, just in a box. Carry-on luggage, I assume. As we all know, there are two types of luggage, carry-on and lost, and nobody wants to lose a suitcase full of money. Um, so, and that would be a way of transporting it. Then you could give it directly to um, per perhaps a middleman or even directly to somebody uh, who is a member of the terrorist organization, and then they can do with it what they choose. Um, there are risks to this. And you can imagine what they are. You can lose the money the person you gave the cash to could decide, wouldn't it be more fun to go to Bermuda and not Belfast? Um, you could be caught. And in fact, cash couriers frequently were caught and are still being caught. So another way of doing it is to use financial institutions. Right? This is their, one of their principal lines of business is to transfer cash um, or to transfer funds from one place to another. So our friend collecting money um, at the Plow and Stars could take the cash and go down to um, a Bank of Boston, open up an account, and deposit that money there and have that transferred to an account in, in Northern Ireland or somewhere else. Um, or could go down to Western Union, for example, deposit the cash there and say, would you please transfer this cash to a Western Union outlet in another location? Those would be two sort of classic ways of doing it. Um, there are other more kind of complicated ways that one could transfer cash using the financial system. 
Um, one popular way, actually, that the IRA used um, was to have a front organization in Boston, for example, uh, that did import-export with the UK uh, or with Ireland, or could, again, conceivably be even the Czechoslovakia back then, if that's where uh, the C5 was going to be purchased. And what you do is you just under and over invoice and as a way of transferring value without the value actually being sent directly through a financial institution. Instead, it is, all right, well, we, we're sending you something that is really worth 100 but we're going to charge, we're going to claim that you're paying $200 for it. And that addition, that hundred would in fact be the additional amount, um, would be the transfer of the funds that had been collected. So there are all these different ways. Um, but it turns out that one of the most easy, cheap, effective ways of doing it is simply to open a bank account and to make a transfer. Or again, uh, it's a little, a little more cumbersome to use uh, Western Union, but the advantage of using one of these transfer agents that is not a bank uh, is that you don't have to open an account. So none of this stuff is particularly confusing, I should think, or hard to imagine. Um, where does the money come from? Somebody collecting it directly for the terrorists. Um, you support uh, the independence of Northern Ireland uh, from the United Kingdom, and you believe that terrorism is the way to achieve it, so therefore you will give me the money, you trust me, I'm somebody who is working um, for this organization, and I will, I will bundle it together. It's almost like bundling and collecting money for political campaigns. Of course, I'm kidding when I say that. Um, bundle it together, and then I will be in charge of the transfer. Um, it could be that that's a little dangerous uh, way of going about if you start letting people, not, not in Boston, of course, with the provisional wing of the IRA, everybody in government was supporting them, but um, you can imagine in other circumstances, I'm going to get to 9-11 in a second, but with um, the LTTE, the so-called Tamil Tigers, uh, who are fighting um, for a separate state in northern Sri Lanka and other terrorist organizations, the Moral Liberation Front in, in uh, the Philippines, for example, uh, that are not favored by the government, or not folks in law enforcement are not looking the other way. And so you don't necessarily want to advertise that you're, hey, I'm collecting money for bad guys. Um, so you might set up a charity and say, okay, what we're doing is we're concerned not about the political oppression in Northern Ireland or in Sri Lanka or in the Philippines. What we're concerned about are the poor folks who are suffering from the horrible conflict that is taking place there. Um, so we set up a charity, and it is a charity to support the widows and orphans in Northern Ireland and there will be a bit of a nudge, nudge, wink, wink, perhaps. Yes, well, we're sending this money to prevent damage to the widows in Northern Ireland by perhaps taking action against those who are oppressing them. Or maybe not. Maybe it's just that I'm appealing to you folks out there to give me money to help the unfortunate and unintended victims of violence. The difference, of course, between those two is that in one case, the folks who are providing the financing know that that's what they're doing. They are, in US legal terms, intentionally providing uh, material support to the terrorists. In the next case, where it is just, I'm, this charity is simply to support uh, the victims of the terrorism, in that case, the folks who are making the donations don't realize that the money is going to support terrorism. They think it's going for something else. And all uh, these are the direct appeal the sort of indirect appeal with a nudge, nudge, wink, wink, and also the completely um, innocent appeal, all have been used to support terrorism uh, around the world. And uh, probably the nudge, nudge, wink, wink, and the uh, completely innocent approach has been more common lately. OK, so let's go to just before 9-11. Um, it's, it's interesting that the principal um, UN resolution, the first one that really came out against the financing of terrorism was before 9-11, although it is the Taliban al-Qaeda resolution. Uh, it's resolution 1267, I think it was 1999 that it was, um, it was adopted by the Security Council, making it mandatory 
um, for all members of the United Nations. And the uh, 1267, uh, I incidentally do work for the 1267 committee, uh, which is running the UN Counterterrorism Implementation Task Force. Um, but that, um, the 1267 committee is just everybody who sits on the Security Council, then they, when they become the Counterterrorism Committee, they just kind of poof and turn into the 1267 committee. Um, but that resolution, because of what was going on in Afghanistan at the time, you may remember that when Bill Clinton was president, he sent in a couple of cruise missiles there to hit a training camp. Um, there was an understanding at that time, before 9-11, that money was going to support, in all the ways just, I just use as an example with respect to um, the IRA, provisional wing of the IRA, I should say, um, that this money was going to do, to keep body and soul, all the way from keeping body and soul together to buying bombs. And without the financing, how could the terrorists operate? They need the money. And I should actually, I should have added earlier, the money is not sufficient coming from its domestic source. Obviously, you don't need to worry about transferring assets um, if you already have them actually within the jurisdiction that the terrorists are operating. Um, and of course, in Afghanistan, Sri Lanka, uh, in the Philippines, various places in Africa, and in Pakistan and India, um, the financing, much of it is coming from outside because they're poor areas. Um, so, but there's an understanding in, in when 1267 was uh, drafted and, and adopted that money was going to Afghanistan. It was coming from various places outside of the country and probably, at least in some ways, some patterns involved financial institutions or including wire transfer um, organizations in the way I had described. So a PS, of course, some of it was coming from uh, friends in Saudi Arabia um, as well in other places. So the committee said adopt it as a requirement um, that all funds of anybody essentially associated with anybody who is controlled by the Taliban or Al-Qaeda um, had to be frozen, right? So any funds controlled by themselves or by any organizations or others controlled by them had to be frozen and seized by any member government of the United Nations, right? This is a mandatory requirement um, under the UN Charter. Now, what's interesting about um, 1267 was, number one, it was limited to Taliban al-Qaeda. And number two, it didn't say how to do it. And number three, it said, okay, how do we know who these people are? If you're the United States, for example, and the U.S. is one of the principal sponsors, and you say, okay, you guys out there, you financial institutions, you have to freeze all these funds that are directly controlled or indirectly controlled by anybody who is Taliban or Al-Qaeda, comma, how do you know what those funds are? Well, the committee was actually set up to answer that question. And the implementation committee of 1267 said, we're going to give you names. So at least we can say to all of you financial institutions, including the transfer agents like Western Union, we will give you names, not just of individual account holders, but of organizations that are controlled by the Taliban, those that are influenced by the Taliban. So the job of financial institutions under this mandatory requirement, um, as opposed to a non-mandatory requirement, as uh, under this requirement, um, knew what to do if they had a customer on whose name was on the list that was provided by the Taliban al-Qaeda committee, which is 1267, which is a security council, boom, you freeze the assets. Not very complicated. Now, it's a bit complicated from the perspective of the Taliban al-Qaeda committee to decide what these, who these people are to get a list going. In fact, what they eventually did was to turn to member governments and say, come on, you guys figure it out. And then you tell us, and we'll put it on this big list. And then everybody has to freeze. There were some problems with implementation in the United States because there were some issues with respect to customer identification in financial institutions here. Um, prior to uh, the terrorist attacks of 9-11, there's quite a bit of dispute within the uh, financial community as to what the requirements should be 
for regulated financial institutions in deciding or determining who the actual beneficial owner and controllers were of accounts in their institutions. In other words, who were the customers behind the customers? Even determining who were the customers in the first place. Um, if I could ask um, who here is from a regulated financial institution or who works in a compliance area? Great. You can correct me as I go along. Um, <clears throat> uh, before 9-11, as I say, there was not a lot of agreement, shall we say, as to the extent to which financial institutions should identify the, their customers, including the folks who controlled their customers. Um, and this was a big problem, because if you don't know who they are, how do you know what assets to freeze? Uh, the issue came up, um, actually, in the, originally in the, the original Bank Secrecy Act, which actually is an interesting misnomer. It's really the Bank No Secrecy Act, um, which was designed to help control money laundering. Okay. Money laundering. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on money laundering because this is a discussion uh, on terrorism financing, but they are closely related with respect to the rules of preventing these two things, money laundering and terrorism financing. So think back now. I have to go back to the 70s and the 80s. Um, I'm a little older than that, so that's actually after I was at the Plow and Stars. But... Um, Drug money was flowing through the financial system in huge amounts, or at least so we were told. And we were told one of the ways of controlling the underlying commission of the underlying crime, which is the sale of prohibited narcotics, was to get the money that constituted the profits from the crime. You make the crime not profitable, it will not take place, or it will take place at a lower rate. So there was a big push by the United States, particularly France and the UK, to come up with the international standards, if not international law, international standards, to prevent money laundering. The first idea, of course, was to require reporting of the deposits of huge amounts of cash into banks. Why? Because folks who are involved in illegal activity, particularly narcotics, tend to buy things not with credit cards or checks. They tend to use cash for obvious reasons. They like to put things into the financial system, big piles of cash, for the other obvious reason, which is that when you go to buy a house and a suitcase full of a million dollars, you look a little funky, right? So you get to get the money into the financial system so that it becomes <laughs> uh, uh, very easy to use uh, for purchasing things or for making transfers, investments, etc. But you've got to do it in such a way that you are not discovered. And so the system of cash reporting um, was proposed and came into effect in the U.S., the $10,000 cash rule, um, and also in some other countries. Um, but it was determined that this really wasn't sufficiently effective, um, in part because of so-called smurfing. I don't know. I'm too old to watch the little weird characters on TV. I don't know where the term smurfing. I think it came from Smurfs, but I don't know. Um, but it's where you break up to 10000 you give it to lots of people, and they deposit it into separate accounts, and then you collect all the, the money together. Uh, it was kind of easy to get around cash reporting. Also, a lot of businesses do use cash. I ran a farm for a while, and everything was in cash. I had my big cash deposit bag at night. They didn't want to send in constant reports with respect to people like me. And, of course, what happened is all these reports kept piling up at the Treasury Department, and nobody looked at them. Um, so that didn't work quite well. So the, the proposal that then became the international standard was that financial institutions need to identify first, identify who their clients are, find out what their normal sort of legal um, customer profile is, what kind of, what kind of, wouldn't they get paid, what they normally pay out so they could figure out what a normal series of transactions is. If they're billionaires uh, investing in, um, uh, I don't know, I was going to say uh, MF Capital, um, then they would see lots of money coming in and then everything disappearing, for example. But anyway, it would be the, the normal patterns of transactions. And then that way, if 
somebody started making big deposits of cash, but it doesn't have to be big deposits of cash, small deposits of cash. Wire transfers from Colombia, wire transfers to Colombia, when you're just a poor little law professor like myself, then that would be outside of the normal pattern of legal transactions. Then it was the job of the financial institution, so that they have to identify their customer, and then they have to get figure out what the customer profile is. Um, and incidentally, if they identify their customer and it turns out their customer is a known drug dealer or something like that, that would be a, a red flag. Um, another red flag would be the transactions that do not seem to match the customer's profile of legal activity. Uh, in those cases, then financial institutions would be required to examine what's going on with a little bit of uh, additional um, resources. And if they suspect money laundering or they suspect that the proceeds of crime are going through their bank, then they have to file something called a suspicious activity report. Um, I actually printed one out this morning. I, I just don't like to use PowerPoint. Um, I worked at the IMF and we always said PowerPoint is really World Bank, um, the competitor across the street. Um, but it is uh, SAR form, suspicious activity reform. Uh, report form. You sort of check what you think is going on. You write a little narrative. Oh, it looks this this poor law professor who teaches at Case Western uh, seems like you know gets re his regular very tiny salary and a little uh, pays a few things for rent or for uh, his mortgage. And all of a sudden he gets a deposit of ten million dollars from Colombia and then he sends it along to Cambodia, something like that. So they would file a SAR, suspicious activity report. Um, so this was proposed. Um, as the international standard by a new group called the Financial Action Task Force, um, which is based in Paris. Uh, all OECD members are also members of the FATF. Other big countries have since joined. Um, and the way in which they were going to enforce these standards, not through the, the actions of formal international law um, with The Hague overseeing things or the Security Council, um, but a self-enforcement action where there would be peer reviews to see if member countries, and actually non-member countries as well, were following these rules. Because the idea was you've got to get every country to do this because money capital is so fluid. If you just have one money laundering center, then uh, the whole system breaks down because um, money launderers will use that place, that jurisdiction. So we're going to have a peer review system to see if countries are following this, and if not, then countries themselves, when they see another jurisdiction that doesn't follow these rules, will take action by making it harder for that non-complying jurisdiction to use the financial institutions or to send money through the financial institutions of the complying jurisdictions. It's a very effective way of doing it. You start out by saying you have to have enhanced due diligence, which means cost, right? Costs go up. So if you're from a, a financial institution in a jurisdiction that doesn't comply, if you're going to engage in transactions with banks or other financial institutions like insurance companies or broker dealers, in uh, complying jurisdictions, costs go up, up to the point where you, the complying jurisdiction says, no more, we're cutting you off. <coughs> Incredibly expensive, as Iran is now discovering. It's very, very difficult to transact business that way. So this was the system that didn't really come into effect um, in the United States because of concerns over privacy, over cost, um, and I'm not kidding you when I, this story is true. Um, a big concern in the United States, according to the chief of staff for the Senate Banking Committee at the time, um, who told me, who was from Texas, told me if, is anybody here from the Deep South? Okay, he told me that if we take the names of our customers, they will use that to take away our guns. Second Amendment. <clears throat> um, of course, some of us who are somewhat more skeptical might have thought, oh, this could have something to do with the fact that Mexican drug money was being laundered through the banks on the border between Texas and Mexico, and they didn't want to lose those customers. But that's, I'm just speculating entirely. It could be something else. Um, anyway, the actual proposed regulation for customer identification uh, written by uh, actually a very good friend of mine who was then doing this stuff at the Fed board 
um, requiring customer identification and various other things to comply with the FATF, the Financial Action Task Force Preventive Measures, um, received the largest number of negative comments during comment period of any regulation in the history of the actual entire solar system, resulting in it not going anywhere. Okay. 9-11 hits. The world has changed. Now, I could someday, and perhaps I'll come back uh, and give a talk on uh, things having to do with changes wrought by 9-11 that have nothing to do with the financing of terrorism. I could talk about that for a long time, but I'm going to leave that up. It's not part of this discussion. Um, but one of the things that changed is that all the folks who are opposed to the money laundering regulations all of a sudden disappeared. And as a result, the USA Patriot Act um, came, uh, was, I forget what the vote was, but it was resoundingly passed. And the USA Patriot Act included all of these standards for customer identification, client account monitoring, and reporting, full compliance with the FATF rules. Um, and then there was something added to it. And that was the financing of terrorism that was really in addition to the pre-existing um, rules with respect to preventing money laundering. And how those came about is itself kind of interesting. 9-11 um, happened. I was in DC. I was um, in, at the IMF in a building that was actually next to the old executive office building. And um, planes, uh, the plane that crashed into the Pentagon uh, had hit, and finally we were ordered to evacuate our building. And I refused to be evacuated. I said, no, blankety blank terrorists kicking me out of the building. And told my colleague, who is a French judge, said, well, Richard, if you're going to stay, I will stay here with you. I said, oh. <clears throat> so I left. <laughs> and it was after that that I got uh, assigned to this issue of, of uh, money laundering counterterrorism. Um, I was appointed to the uh, select, the managing director of the fund. This is before Strauss-Kahn. Um, everybody was fully clothed, for example. Um, the new managing director, uh, the old managing director appointed me to this uh, select committee on what the fund and the bank should do to um, assist the international financial community in combating terrorism financing. Um, but before that, the FATF met in a sort of an emergency session in DC and adopted what were then the eight, later the nine, special recommendations on terrorism financing. So it was the anti-money laundering group that took over with respect to terrorism financing. And it makes a certain amount of sense, right? Because they're the ones who are talk trying to keep the crooks out of the banking system. And they're also the ones that are pushing customer identification. So go back. We've got 1267 committee, the Taliban Al-Qaeda committee, says, OK, we've got this list. We're complying a list of people that we think are Taliban Al-Qaeda. And then also organizations that are controlled. The problem is, how do we know um, which bank accounts and should be free, frozen and seized? How do we know which people should be kept out of making wire transfers, for example, uh, through Western Union? Um, well, once we know who those account holders are, then we can check that, take that list and check it against our customer list, right? Al-Qaeda, Taliban, their organizations, and then the customer list. And then financial institutions just do that. It shouldn't take them very long. And boom. And in fact, that is what happened, right? A fair amount of money was seized from Taliban, Al-Qaeda, and um, and actually, that was fairly successful. In fact, we called it the Santa Claus is coming to town provision, making a list, checking it twice, going to find out who's naughty and nice, which is kind of appropriate for this season. Um, but the other thing we did, and I should say I was there and I supported it, um, was to add to this requirement that financial institutions not just do the Santa Claus is coming to town thing, but they do what they are required to do now as a result of the USA Patriot Act, and we're doing to a certain extent um, under the original Bank Secrecy Act. And this is not just financial institutions in the US now. Every country is going to be doing this, um, is to monitor client accounts to see, will come up, you know, the profile. They have to do this already for anti-money laundering. Um, monitor client accounts to see if <coughs> they are 
financing terrorism. I sat there in the room, um, I'm trying to think of the, at the Washington Hilton, and so I don't know, so I supported this idea. Uh, part of the um, eight, now nine recommendations against terrorism was to pay particular attention to not-for-profit organizations because some folks thought, um, as in the example I gave for the uh, provisional wing of the Irish Republican Army, that that was a standard way of raising money. And certainly it was for the Tamil Tigers and some of the other organizations I mentioned. Uh, didn't look like it was the case for the 9-11 hijackers um, but, uh, and terrorists. Um, but so a special recommendation was put in saying, uh, not quite clear what that meant, but special attention should be given uh, to um, charitable organizations. So but look what we were asking financial institutions to do. And this went into the USA Patriot Act as well. We were saying, you're supposed to not just make a list and check it twice. You're supposed to figure out who the terrorists are. And if you think you know who they are, or they raise a suspicion, just like in the anti-money laundering area, you send that nice little form off to the United States Treasury Department, something called the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, or FinCEN. I will say it is run by the Internal Revenue Service. I have friends who work there, so I will not say anything more. Um, and then it's the job of the government, once they have this tip-off, just like in money laundering, to go and decide whether they want to do an investigation, whether they want to send the FBI on it, carry this through to a full-on prosecution, and of course, most importantly, whether the assets should be seized, uh, bank account, or if you're a money transfer agent like Western Union, whether you would immediately pick up the phone, call the police, or at least keep the person away from using, um, using that particular service for transferring the cash. Um, that system was, well, let's just say not well thought out. Um, over the years, certainly even since the late 1970s, financial institutions, um, prosecutors, uh, tax authorities throughout the world had been working together and with the Financial Action Task Force that was set up in 1990, and I might add that although that was the standard setter, uh, the members were tended to be wealthy countries, so other similar task forces were set up around the world, and their job was to try to corral, um, for example, the first one set up in, um, after the FATF was the, the Asian group um, on money laundering, which always to me sounded like they were supporting it. I kept saying, why don't you say against money laundering? But. Um, and so these groups were also out there trying to promulgate these rules and to act the way the FATF did by mutual evaluation, so-called um, peer review, to make sure that they were implemented. Um, so this whole system is wor now worldwide, but what does it actually mean? And the answer was, at that time, who knows? The, certainly the list checking rule. Well, that even in and of itself turned out to be fairly difficult, right? Because in the good old days, it was under the 1267 committee, it was Taliban al-Qaeda. Um, now, post 9-11, in order to get the entire commu world community particularly interested in going after bad guys in general, uh, the Security Council met um, after 9-11, that's often called the 9-11 committee, the 1373 uh, committee, resolution 1373, which extended the mandatory requirement for freezing and seizing assets to all terrorists. Um, how do you how do you go, how do financial institutions go about this, right? For all those years, they knew, or had been working on what looks like money laundering transactions. Oh, smurfing. Um, that's called the placement stage, right? If you're going to get cash into the system, but it doesn't just have to be cash. You can. There are ways of having. Uh, squeezing money th out of crime other than through cash, right? Including such things as, oh, I don't know, overcharging for government contracts, for example, and then that's not in cash. Um, but the so-called, that's after the placement stage, the stage where you're trying to cover up who you are, the person who is engaged in the crime, or where the money is. That's also often called the layering stage. It just means you start shuttling it among different accounts, maybe in different countries, just to kind of cover your tracks. 
um, folks kind of had a pretty good idea of what that stuff looked like. But nobody had an idea of what a terrorism financing transaction looked like. And the main reason for that is that if you are, or at least the, as the thinking went at the time, if you are a terrorist, um, it's the end user who's the bad guy. Not, I mean, conceivably could be the, first, the person who's providing the financing, but not always. As we said, um, as I discussed or mentioned earlier, it could be innocents who are making donations and don't realize that the money is going to terrorists. They think it's going to um, medical care, for example, for uh, orphans in a war zone. So it's the end user who is the thief. In this case, it's the end user, I should say, who is the terrorist, um, as opposed to the thief or the drug dealer or whoever, who is actually the person who puts the money into the system. It's a very different concept. Um, just as an, as an aside, when the, this discussion was going on about um, how we would add these terrorism financing uh, standards to the FATF general anti-money laundering rules, he said, well, terrorism financing, terrorist this. I, uh, excuse me. <laughs> um, is it just terrorists, or can we, like, add other bad guys to the list? Um, say somebody who is a criminal who is not a terrorist? And the answer was no. Um, we want to make sure this is a focus on 9-11. I said, so let me get this straight. So if I go into a bank with an AK-47, and I say, I'm going to take some money out of the bank account to buy some bullets for my gun. And the teller says, what are you going to do with your gun? I say, I'm going to go home, and I'm going to shoot my wife. OK, that's fine. I don't have to file a, I don't have to make a phone call, because I'm not financing terrorism. I'm merely financing murder. Um, but if I go into the bank and say, what are you going to do? Well, I'm going to use this gun. I'm just going to show it to the, pers the, the parking cop, and that's all. To, to try to convince the parking cop not to give me a ticket. Oh, terrorism, because under the definition, uh, using a, uh, a threat against a government official is, a ter is terrorism. But anyway, so that's just another sort of example, I suppose, of how do you enforce these rules? How does a financial institution know what a terrorism financing transaction is? The answer, of course, is nobody did. So. Over time, um, there have been great difficulties in trying to encourage financial institutions, encourage meaning through the regulatory system, including uh, regulatory action, to implement effective techniques for identifying terrorists other than those who are on the list. Now, banks have been very, banks and other financial institutions have been good um, at doing the things that are kind of understandably, maybe even obvious which is that uh, you can go to a hire a commercial database um, to review all the customer names that you have, and they can run it against their database to see if there's some sort of match with somebody who may have turned up in a newspaper or even a blog as having terrorist connections. Maybe you can do that. But what about the transactions themselves? That's what you do in money laundering. Like you get the profile and you see the transactions. Well, the first really great, in my opinion, <clears throat> um, terrorist or suspicious activity reports filed with something that looks like it could be a terrorist act because the person who actually put funds into the system was richer than God, and there was no reason to assume that she or he was a money launderer. But the concern was the end user, the person who took the money out of the account, who was not the person who put the money in. Right? That's typical. That's what you do with money laundering. You're trying to cleanse the taint um, from the money, but you, the person who receives the proceeds of crime or generates it, you want it at the end, right? You're not in the charity business. Was my Harvard Law School classmate, Elliot Spitzer. Does everybody here remember the great Spitzer event? Um, what he was doing was uh, transferring funds to the emperor, uh, I forget the official name, it was a uh, very expensive, um, prostitution outfit. And uh, he had money in his account. He transferred it through actually <laughs> through uh, so-called dummy companies. They're just companies that have no actual uh, business activity in a couple of banks um, as a way of hiding the transfers from his wife. And then the end user was not a terrorist, I don't think, but was 
nor a murderer, but somebody who is breaching the law. And the rules are only for terrorism, right? He was clearly not laundering money, richer than God. Um, the end user was not a terrorist. Again, that I, I don't know her personally. Um, but it was a kind of transaction that's the, where the, the beginning is not what you care about, it's the end that you care about, right? The end user. And, but he was actually, he was actually caught, um, and as you all know, um, and as far as I know, that's the only really effective implementation of the, uh, of the terrorism financing uh, preventive measures uh, that I'm aware of. So anyway, post Elliot Spitzer, um, it was proposed by the um, 1267 committee, the Counterterrorism Committee, the Taliban Al-Qaeda Committee, that somebody actually do a study to find out what terrorists do with their money. And that is what we did. Um, a large team of uh, students at Case Western Reserve University got together with the assistance of the U.S. Justice Department, uh, their counterterrorism task force, to get as much information as we could on every financial transaction of every prosecution in the U.S. for uh, any kind of terrorism-related thing. And I say that specifically, not just material support or not just terrorism, but what justice often does um, to prosecute folks they don't like, but they don't have a lot of evidence, or they just want to do something uh, that they know is going to be more effective in court rather than a long, drawn-out process, which is prosecute them for perjury or something else. So with the help of the Justice Department, we gathered all these cases. There were 266. Um, and looked through them, and with the help of U.S. attorneys, uh, helping where they could, because a lot of the evidence with respect to financial transactions was not publicly available, um, we went through them and found around 30 that where the terrorists use um, financial institutions in a, in a significant way, other than just to having a personal account uh, to buy groceries and that kind of thing, something that would be material and could be actually noted by a bank um, as being unusual. And we found that of all of those, and there's, I, I'm a little careful about what I'm saying now, and I, I should actually say, um, if you have any inter continued interest in this topic, come to our um, afternoon symposium on this issue on March 2nd uh, at Case Western Reserve University, because we're going to talk about the specifics of this report. Um, we're going to have all the top folks, the head of the Financial Action Task Force, the head of the International Group of Financial Intelligence Units, those like FinCEN who are in charge of um, deciding whether suspicious activity reports should be investigated. Um, so I'm going to be a little careful about uh, discussing the conclusions here because they haven't reviewed them yet. But all the transactions um, actually are money laundering transactions in terms of their signature in terms of their red flags. Now, we don't know yet why. It could be just that if you're a terrorist and you want to hide what you're doing, you just take the normal anti-money laundering sort of steps, even though what you're trying to do is not hide the, in fact, the vast majority of these cases, I should mention, are not, the launder, are not using proceeds of crime to finance the terrorist act. They're not. But they're using money laundering sort of standard patterns, which are used normally to disguise the proceeds of crime, the ownership, um, or the, the uh, bad provenance, shall we say, of those proceeds. Normally, that's what happens. But in this case, they're not criminal proceeds, but they're still using exactly the same techniques. And in these cases, um, we would predict that any bank would file a suspicious activity report and that that would have gone to the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network and they should have caught the terrorists based on that. They scream, absolutely scream out, bad actor, bad actor, not terrorist, definitely not terrorist, but money launderer. Now, should a financial institution know that something that is a transaction that looks like money laundering is actually financing of terrorism? I will now speak for myself and not, obviously, for the um, Counterterrorism Implementation Task Force. But it seems a little odd for governments that have all oh, those things called like spy agencies and stuff like that, 
um, that they should be telling financial institutions, no, your job is to find out whether these folks who are engaging in dodgy transactions are terrorists or launderers or what. I kind of think that should be the job of the government. Um, they're the ones with, who are involved in law enforcement, including the, the counterterrorism area. Um, that's my own personal opinion. Um, but at least the financial institutions, pro I'm guessing, sent in suspicious activity reports. Um, we don't know for a fact if they did because a regulation that came out just as we were completing this report bans the government from revealing to us whether SARS were filed. Now, interestingly enough, the, the government was about to do so. And this interesting regulation popped out saying that they were not allowed to do so. And as a result, we could not tell whether SARS were filed. Um, but um, that would be my guess. So that's the stage we're at now. Uh, in March, the end of the seminar on March 2nd, when we have lots of private sector and public sector folks coming in, including from the international side, we're going to review this report and make some recommendations on how to change the special nine recommendations against terrorism financing, how the USA Patriot Act might be changed, how the implementation of the Patriot Act might be changed, to make it possible, uh, in effect, to lift the burden of financial institutions with respect to this requirement of doing something that's very difficult to do. And I'm going to turn this over to questions in one second. But also the burden of the folks who are being cut out of the financial system because it is easier or just practically speaking, it's the only thing to do um, with respect to private institutions like banks that are profit making. Um, it's just too expensive to take in clients who have a profile that matches maybe a terrorist. All those charities I was talking about, right? Um, you're raising the cost to financial institutions to take their business. Why? Because we, including me, put that in as part of the special recommendations, a kind of a don't trust charities. But it could be don't trust anybody. Because if you don't have a mechanism actually to identify the real suspicious characters with respect to terrorism financing, and your regulators are telling you you've got to do something, you've got to do something. And the something that you do may be bad overall. Anyway, uh, thanks very much. And um, questions, if there are any. It seems like we always criticize TSA and everything they seem to do is reactionary, like three ounces of liquid, when it seems like you know, anybody with any sort of sophistication could easily get around, you know, and everything seems to be reactionary. In this context, it seems like that's an even bigger issue when you have everyday electronic, new electronic means of transferring money, like PayPal and Bitcoin and all these things. That Do you see that, that, that that's going to be the undoing? Like no one's sort of looking like at algorithms. Maybe they are. But ways to sort of stay a step ahead. We're always going to be six months, a year behind the latest way to transfer. Oh, I think you've absolutely put your finger on it. Um, in fact, what, in effect, what, I think there are two issues. One is the new forms of uh, financial transfer. And of course, the anti-money laundering rules um, under the Patriot Act apply to them too. Right? So anybody who is, going to, who is involved in transfer, in fact, I, I could tell you a funny story about a meeting I was at where one of these new transfer uh, systems, I won't mention what, should, what it is, but I gave, was giving a talk and uh, he came up to me afterwards and said, oh yeah, I was wondering, um, do you have any, uh, do you take clients? I said, I do, yeah, I, I mean, I, I teach, but that gets boring, so I, I didn't say that. Um, but I'd like to have clients too. And I said, because, you know, I'm, I'm under indictment for money laundering because my organization <laughs> here, we do. Um, so yeah, I think that's a big issue. Um, so yeah, how do you actually get these organizations, these new systems to comply with the law? That's hard. And that even extends to some of the old systems. How do you, you go to, I've been to, I wouldn't say most countries of the world, but a big chunk of them and where informal systems of transfer are still very important. Um, even that over-invoicing I mentioned, how do you do, how do you actually police that? It's hard to do, it's very important. The second thing is, when you're talking about algorithms, um, what we did in this exercise was to look at what folks have been terrorists that have been identified and prosecuted, we don't know how else to find terrorists, um, what they have done in the past, and we did sort of an empirical study. <coughs> 
But as a, as a more general matter, it's a fairly limited empirical study. And it's backward looking, not forward looking. Um, it would be nice if we could have greater empirical studies, not just in the US. And we tried to do this in other countries. When two of my colleagues um, tried to get information, in particularly about Sri Lanka, some of the big hotbeds, and the UK had incredible difficulty getting information because no society, in effect, is as open as ours. Um, so we had difficulty finding out what the algorithms are outside of the US. But I think, yeah, more empirical work absolutely is essential. Um, you, you mentioned about a third of the way in, in, into your talk uh, that uh, the, the terrorist groups use um, the, the idea that, that, that they're helping uh, widows and orphans. Now, for, 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 an, for let's say, a, a very rich and very innocent person who, uh, who actually wants to, to help widows and orphans but, but, but not give a dime to, uh, to, to finance any, any, any acts of terrorism, uh, how, how would you advise such a person to, to achieve their goal? That's also a great question. Um, in trying to implement that rule uh, in the FATF eight special, now nine special recommendations on terrorism financing, um, the principal sort of arguments presented were what we need to do is to come up with standards, not terrorism financing standards, but governance standards for nonprofits. If a well governed nonprofit um, exists, or if the nonprofit that you're planning to give money to is well governed, then the governing board, the trustees, those folks who are actually managing and operating the charity, will ensure that money is not being used for nefarious purposes, including terrorism financing. And the Treasury Department in the US actually came up with a white paper on sort of good standards for governance. So I think the answer is only give money to a charity that meets those standards, at a minimum, I would say. And if the charity does, then at least you know you're safe. Um, the problem is that not all charities meet all needs. All charities that are structured and well-governed meet all needs. So that's, I think that's a problem. And even well-governed charities can have insiders. I mean, one of the cases we looked at uh, involved sending money to um, post-earthquake relief in Pakistan. And the charity was very well governed. It had kind of famous people on it, um, clean records that they turned over to the financial institutions that were making transfers to Pakistan. But there was, the money would arrive in the bank account in Pakistan of the charity there. And practically speaking, you then need to do things like buy blankets and tents and food um, which is actually one of the main things they were doing. And they had an insider there in Pakistan who was siphoning off some of this money and turning it over to Taliban. How can you possibly, as a donor, how can you control that? I don't think you can. Um, it's going to be a choice of the risk of running that, um, that an insider over there. I mean, look at the Pakistani government. Some questions have been raised as to whether in every one of the government is actually actively trying to control terrorism, um, particularly with respect to the Taliban. So even if they give you a, a clean bill of health over there, you cannot necessarily assume uh, that every penny is going to go to the, the charitable purpose. So I guess it's kind of a balancing test. Well, thank you very much. Don't forget March 2nd.